20. Carly Hurtle When 18-year-old Carly Hurtle noticed a poorly parked car outside a Jewish community center in Chesterfield, Missouri in 2014, she allegedly felt so bothered by it that she covered the windows and mirrors with mascara. The teen was also accused of scratching the car's windshield and driver's side window, leaving the vehicle with an estimated $3,000 worth of damages. After falling under suspicion for the crime, Hurtle reportedly confessed to the vandalism and admitted leaving a note on the car, stating, how about you park your car like a normal person? The note contained several expletives and described the vehicle as a gay car. When questioned about her motive, the young woman explained that she was mad over how the car was parked. She was charged with first-degree property damage as a result. Police Captain Steve Lewis told local station KMOV that it was entirely possible that the car was parked poorly, but that it didn't permit anyone to damage the vehicle or any of the owner's other property. 19. Parking Spot Dispute Wrecks Brand New Bakery a bakery in Flushing, Queens was celebrating its grand opening in November 2020 when two cars occupied by two men each got into a dispute over a parking spot nearby. Footage of the encounter showed two men exiting one of the vehicles with a baseball bat and swinging at their adversaries. One of the men from the other car, 24-year-old Zhe Zhao, allegedly got into his Audi and tried mowing the baseball bat-wielding par down. But he missed his target and instead plowed into the bakery. As a result, the storefront was completely smashed and two women were treated for injuries. Two of the men involved in the fight were also hospitalized and multiple arrests were made. Zhao was charged with reckless endangerment and assault, while 35-year-old Jonathan Zhang was also hit with an assault charge. However, it's unclear whether the other two suspects are facing criminal consequences. The bakery had just opened days before the crash. Owner John Lowe told CBS2 that he was really worried about his business and his employees, especially after spending a lot of money on renovations. Speaking with ABC7, Andy Chen of the Asian American Community Empowerment Advocacy Group partially blamed New York City's mayor for eliminating parking spots in the area, which he said was forcing drivers to compete over parking spaces. 18. Haley Hightower An argument between exes in a billiard club parking lot ended in physical destruction in May of 2023, when 34-year-old Haley Hightower allegedly rammed her vehicle into the building. The disagreement occurred outside a pool hall in Mobile, Alabama shortly after midnight. According to police, Hightower's ex-boyfriend eventually abandoned the discussion and entered the business, prompting the enraged woman to get behind the wheel and drive through the building's entrance. The vehicle struck two victims who were standing near the door, causing non-life-threatening injuries. Hightower was charged with three counts of criminal mischief, two counts of assault, and one count each of reckless endangerment and public intoxication. 17. Parking Space Beat Down 21-year-old Angelica Lozano wasn't looking for a fight when she attacked a man outside a Chinese restaurant in San Antonio in September of 2018. Security video showed the young woman and her mother, Norma, exiting their vehicle when the man approached them and allegedly accused them of taking a parking space that he was waiting for. Norma brushed the man off and continued walking toward the restaurant, but Angelica had a much different reaction when he kicked the woman's vehicle. In the video, she could be seen walking straight over to the man and punching the much larger man in the face, which proved to be a regrettable decision when he slammed her head into a vehicle and punched her six times. The footage showed Angelica collapsing to the ground while the man shoved an intervening bystander. He was also accused of punching Angelica's mother behind a vehicle out of the camera's view. Several weeks after the incident, the visibly injured young woman told local station ABC6 that she didn't go to the restaurant that day to beat someone up, contrary to allegations that were circulating on social media. She said that she was angry about the damage to her car from being kicked and that she was defending her mother. Angelica's father, Henry Lozano, admitted that based on the footage alone, it might look like his daughter instigated the fight, but he insisted that the video, which had no audio, didn't tell the full story. 
the family seemed exasperated by the treatment they were receiving, which made them feel like they were constantly under attack. Speaking with ABC6, Angelica said that she didn't know what was worse, the physical beating during the confrontation gone wrong, or the emotional and mental beating her family took every day from people who blamed her for taking the first hit. At the time, law enforcement said that they'd identified the man in the video and that he was a suspect, but it's unclear whether he was arrested in connection with the case. 16. Mowed down by a motorized cart when two elderly British gentlemen arrived at a bakery that had just one remaining pastry available for sale in December 2023, they were both determined to get their hands on the baked goods. A man on a scooter became visibly angry when he saw another senior citizen pay for the pastry and erupted into a tirade outside the store in the English town of Bideford. When 21-year-old Oakley Richard saw what was happening, she pulled her phone out and began recording the incident. She later told news agency SWNS that the irate senior citizen berated other patrons while raising his cane in a threatening manner. The video, captured by Richards, showed the retiree plowing his scooter into a man who just asked him if he needed any help, causing the victim to fall backwards over a sign. Disapproving onlookers helped the victim up and admonished the elderly man, who denied knocking the victim over and said, he just walked towards me. One passerby took the suspect's cane away, while another removed the key from his scooter, which was later confiscated by police. A police spokesperson said that the scooter's owner had been identified, but that all other parties had left the scene by the time officers arrived. And without any victims, there weren't going to be any arrests. Authorities encouraged anyone who was involved and wished to make a report to contact them and file a complaint. 15. Stephen Schwartz In December 2023, an 85-year-old Washington, D.C. man named Stephen Schwartz was accused of stabbing his wife to death because he didn't want to eat some pancakes she made for him. According to federal authorities, Schwartz plunged a carving knife into the back of 81-year-old Sharon Hilda Schwartz because she was pressuring him to eat the pancakes in an attempt to help him put on weight. The accused wife killer would later tell law enforcement that he'd recently lost as much as 50 pounds during a hospital stay due to psychiatric and physical ailments. He'd only eaten a quarter of a Krispy Kreme donut the day before and had told Hilda that he didn't plan to eat breakfast that day. Stephen initially caved when his wife placed the pancakes in front of him, but he changed his mind just as quickly, sparking the argument that led to Hilda's death. An affidavit states that the last thing Stephen claimed to remember before stabbing Hilda was the sound of a plate shattering against the wall. Neighbors overheard screaming and called the couple's son, who arrived at the house minutes later and had to push his mother's body out of the way in order to get inside. Stephen's son took the knife out of his hand, but by the time police arrived, he'd grabbed another one, and officers ended up tasing the octogenarian in order to subdue him. The couple were rushed to a nearby hospital, where Sharon was pronounced dead while Stephen survived his injuries. An autopsy found that Sharon had died from a single stab wound which had punctured her heart. After being taken into custody, Stephen allegedly acted shocked by the actions he was accused of. He said that it was a crazy fight and described Sharon as a bit of a taskmaster, but acknowledged that she was nagging him to eat because she loved him and wanted him to regain his health. Stephen then pleaded not guilty to the crime and was ordered to be held without bond. 14. Hangry for a Hush Puppy a pregnant 20-year-old was working at Long John Silver's in Evansville, Indiana in January 2022 when a woman pulled up to the drive through window and tried ordering a single hush puppy. When the employee explained that the restaurant only sells the deep-fried side dish in orders of two, the customer became enraged and yelled a racial slur at her. In the meantime, the woman's friend repeatedly called the restaurant on the phone demanding to speak with the manager. The victim and two co-workers who witnessed the incident later told police that the hangry hush puppy fanatic entered the restaurant and began trashing it when she was told to leave. They accused the suspect of kicking the pregnant worker in the stomach before finally running out the door. 
According to a police report, the victim was unsure whether her attacker knew she was pregnant. Unfortunately, though, the license plates on the vehicle the woman left in weren't clear enough to read in the store's surveillance footage. Evansville police appealed to the public for help identifying the suspect, but the case appears to remain unsolved. The source of the woman's rage is an even bigger mystery, especially considering the fact that a pair of hush puppies cost less than $2 at the restaurant. 13. Christina Blair In early 2022, 911 dispatchers in Albuquerque, New Mexico, received a call from a man claiming that a woman had threatened him with a gun in a case of road rage. According to an arrest report, Gabriel Chavez told a responding officer that he was stopped at an intersection when a woman pulled up behind him and began honking the horn and yelling obscenities about his pro-vaccine bumper sticker. He tried waving at the woman to drive around him, but she allegedly refused and continued to follow him. Chavez said that he was waiting at a traffic light in the left turn lane when the irate driver, later identified as 33-year-old Christina Blair, threw something at his car, causing him to panic. Fearing for his safety, he tried driving through the red light without realizing he'd put his car into reverse. He hit the gas and backed up into Blair's vehicle, then pulled into a nearby parking lot to exchange insurance information. Chavez claimed that Blair only became more irate as he tried giving her his insurance info. He said that he saw the woman retrieve a handgun from her vehicle and watched as she loaded around into the chamber. Worried that the suspect was going to shoot him, Chavez cautiously backed away and dialed 911. But by the time the responding officer arrived, Blair had left the scene. After being arrested at her home, she admitted to honking at Chavez at a red light as a reaction to his Provax bumper sticker, but claimed that he was purposely driving like three miles per hour in front of her and impeding traffic. Blair also admitted to honking at Chavez at another intersection and yelling at him, throwing a water bottle at his car, and retrieving her handgun during the conversation they had after the fender bender. She accused Chavez of trying to block her from leaving and claimed that she felt fearful for her safety when she grabbed the gun. The officer concluded that Blair had an opportunity to safely get away from Chavez and arrested her on suspicion of felony aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. She was held in jail for several days until her first court hearing, where she pleaded not guilty. In a surprising turn of events, though, the prosecutor dropped the case then and there, noting that it's not a crime in New Mexico to be visibly armed during a verbal argument in the absence of an accompanying threat of force. Blair is reportedly suing the city of Albuquerque for allegedly unlawfully charging her with a crime based on false information. In the complaint, she claimed that she had lost her job as a result of the incident and the unwarranted media attention that came with her arrest. She accused Chavez of deliberately striking her vehicle and argued that he had recorded their parking lot interaction on his phone and that the video should show that she never pointed her gun at him. For now, the civil case appears to be ongoing. 12. Robert Goldwitzer Jr. When an angry customer called a McDonald's in Ankeny, Iowa in June of 2021 and complained that he hadn't received any dipping sauces for his 30-piece McNugget order, an assistant manager told him that he was welcome to return to the restaurant and retrieve the condiments. It's admittedly frustrating when something like this happens, but most people would likely agree that the man overreacted by threatening to blow up the store and punching the employee in the face. According to a criminal complaint, police traced the phone number on the restaurant's caller ID to 42-year-old Robert Goldwitzer Jr. He allegedly admitted to making the threats, telling detectives that he was extremely upset with the restaurant staff for getting his order wrong. Goldwitzer was charged with one felony count of falsely reporting an explosive or incendiary device, but pleaded guilty to a reduced misdemeanor harassment charge. And in the end, he was sentenced to a year of probation on top of being fined $430. 11. Judith Black 23-year-old Tapricia Brown was working at a Burger King restaurant in Wildwood, Florida in May of 2021 when an elderly customer approached the counter and complained about the thickness of the tomato on her Whopper. Later identified as 78-year-old Judith Black, 
the disgruntled patron allegedly launched into a tirade of verbal abuse against Brown and other employees, prompting Brown to tell her that she'd only help her if she calmed down. According to an arrest report, Black threw the whopper at the worker, called her a racist name, and then stormed out of the restaurant with her husband. Deprisha later told police that she could hear Black calling her another derogatory term in the parking lot as she stepped outside with a co-worker. The young woman's allegations were supported by numerous witnesses, including a manager, a co-worker, and a customer. Surveillance footage also corroborated the claim about Black throwing a whopper at the employee. Responding officers identified Black as the suspect by running her license plate number. She admitted to throwing her whopper at Brown because she was upset about her complaint not being addressed and to calling the victim a derogatory name. The officer who wrote the report mentioned that under typical circumstances, the incident would warrant a misdemeanor battery charge. But in this case, the charge was upgraded to a third-degree felony due to Black's racist behavior. Three months after the altercation, Black pleaded no contest to a reduced battery charge. She was sentenced to a year of probation, fined $785, and was ordered to undergo anger management classes. The judge also banned her from the Burger King restaurant where the incident occurred and ordered her to have no contact with the victim. 10. John Sandoval Typical Saturday morning took a chaotic turn for an elderly Florida couple in November 2023, when a disagreement over their coffee maker turned into a major blowout. According to an affidavit, the argument between 70-year-old John Sandoval and his 75-year-old wife occurred roughly 30 miles north of Orlando in their Sorrento home. They were bickering back and forth because there was no water in their coffee maker when Sandoval allegedly threw a package of Oreo cookies at his wife. The airborne snack hit the woman in the chest, causing her to fall onto the floor. She later told police that Sandoval put his hands around her neck but didn't restrict her airway. Sandoval, on the other hand, claimed to have no recollection of wrapping his hands around his wife's throat and said that he helped her up off the floor after she fell. He also mistakenly thought the Oreos had struck her in the head. Police arrested Sandoval on a felony charge of battery on a person 65 or older. He posted a $2,000 bond and was released with instructions to have no contact with the victim. According to records, Sandoval was convicted of misdemeanor battery in 2005 in a case involving the same woman. He was sentenced to three years of probation and was ordered to attend a batterer's intervention program and a domestic violence intervention class. 9. Charles Doty Jr. Kimberly Morrill's first shift at a Little Caesars restaurant in Knoxville, Tennessee ended with a disgruntled customer pointing a gun at her because he got impatient while waiting for his food. The incident occurred in November 2021, after a worker told 64-year-old Charles Doty Jr. that his pizza would be ready in 10 minutes. Doty left the restaurant and returned with an AK-47, which he pointed at Morrow while demanding his pizza, along with a free order of the chain's famous crazy bread as compensation for the wait. When Doty noticed another employee trying to leave the store, he asked him where the hell he thought he was going. In the meantime, a fellow customer gave Doty her pizza in an attempt to de-escalate the situation. The hangry, gun-wielding suspect accepted the pizza and left the restaurant before police arrived. He was subsequently charged with four counts of aggravated assault. A little bit of patience would have gone a long way for Doty, according to employee Noah Beeler, who told local station WATE that it would have taken less than 10 minutes and possibly as little as two or three minutes to have the pizza boxed and ready to go. The case finally concluded nearly two years later in September of 2023, when Doty pleaded guilty to all four aggravated assault counts. Records show that he received a six-year split confinement sentence and that he's serving one year in jail, indicating that he'll spend the remaining five years on probation. 8. Nicholas Schelb and Terry Patterson an Indiana couple were at the tail end of a methamphetamine binge in 2014 when they got into an argument about doing laundry that ended in both of them getting arrested. 
According to police, the disagreement between 23-year-old Terry Patterson and 29-year-old Nicholas Shelb escalated when Shelb picked dog feces up off the floor of their Evansville home and rubbed it on his girlfriend. Later on in the argument, Shelb allegedly picked up some more dog poop and threw it at Patterson. Police arrived at the residence in the early morning hours to find Patterson pounding on the back door and screaming after being locked out of the home. According to a police report, her feet were bleeding and there were large clumps of dog feces in her hair and on her face and clothing. The report noted that Shelb answered the door covered in feces and that the home's interior was covered in shattered glass, parts of a broken coffee table and, of course, more dog poop. Shelp reportedly admitted during questioning that he and Patterson had stayed up all night smoking meth. Both parties tested positive for the drug, and they were each charged with one count of felony child neglect, while Shelp was hit with two additional battery counts. 7. Brian Duffy 40-year-old Brian Duffy had a lengthy rap sheet even before he was accused of battering a 7-Eleven employee with a Slurpee in Pinellas Park, Florida. His prior convictions included theft, trespassing, cocaine possession, synthetic marijuana possession, violating an order of protection, violating probation, and leaving the scene of an accident. The repeat offender decided to lengthen his criminal history in July of 2020, when he threw an explosive fit over the price of his Slurpee. He thought he was being overcharged, and when he failed to get the situation addressed to his liking, he knocked the Slurpee out of the worker's hand, dousing her in the frozen drink. When confronted by police, Duffy admitted to the disagreement over the Slurpee's price, but denied having any memory of backhanding the beverage out of the victim's hand. According to a police report, the store surveillance footage confirmed the victim's allegations. Duffy was charged with battery with a felony enhancement due to his criminal record. He pleaded guilty and could have faced up to five years in prison, but was sentenced to just five days with credit for time served and walked free. The judge also banned Duffy from the 7-Eleven store where the incident took place and ordered him to have no contact with the victim. A notation in the sentencing score sheet indicates that the COVID-19 pandemic was a factor in the judge's decision not to impose a harsher punishment. 6. Bruce Shell All hell broke loose at a Sumter County, Florida household in September 2022 during a heated argument over Chinese takeout, resulting in the arrest of two family members. According to a police report, 51-year-old Bruce Shell became irate about the restaurant's failure to label the takeout containers after discovering that his son had unknowingly eaten his order. Bruce's wife, who declined to participate in the meal, was in her bedroom when she overheard crashing and yelling coming from elsewhere in the home. She told Wildwood Police that she entered the kitchen to find her husband holding her son in a headlock and punching him in the face repeatedly, while her daughter, 25-year-old Atlantis Ann Shell, grabbed the victim's arms. The woman said she yelled at Bruce and Atlantis to stop several times and that the attack continued until she dialed 911. She noticed that her son's face had turned bright red and the victim himself told police that he couldn't breathe when he was in the chokehold. The victim also told responding officers that his father was upset with him for telling his mum that his sister was intoxicated. In addition to being struck by his father, he accused Atlantis of attacking him and punching him before his father entered the room and joined in the assault. According to the arrest report, the victim said that he tried to get away from his attackers but was unable to. Atlantis accused her brother of taking the first hit and shoving her to the floor, which the victim denied. She further claimed that Bruce walked in on the victim attacking her and that he helped pull his son off of her. Bruce gave police the same version of events and denied hitting his son, but the officer who took the report noted that he observed visible injuries on the victim that were consistent with the victim's version of events and no injuries on Bruce or Atlantis. Consequently, he concluded that the victim was being truthful and arrested the father-daughter duo. Bruce Shell was charged with felony battery by strangulation and one misdemeanor battery count, while Atlantis was charged with misdemeanor battery. They posted bond and were released, and can only hope that the family got along better following their return home. 5. Beaten for Burping 
43-year-old No Perrett belched while waiting for a meat order at a grocery store in High Point, North Carolina just days before Christmas in 2023. A lot of people believe that burping in public is rude, but very few would consider it reason enough to lose one's temper. Perez, unfortunately, was in the presence of a man who fell into the latter category. Apparently, too offended by the 43-year-old construction worker's burping to forget about it and carry on with his day, the man confronted Perez as he exited the store with a female companion. According to a police report obtained by the smoking gun, the suspect punched Perez in the face and kicked him in the hand before fleeing the scene in a vehicle with three other males. Perez suffered a black eye but declined medical assistance, and for now, the suspect remains at large. 4. Justin Garcia For most families, the topic of whether almond milk or whole milk was superior to the other would amount to little more than a fun debate, but it was apparently a very serious matter for 30-year-old Justin Garcia of Lehigh Acres, Florida, who was accused of slashing his cousin with a pocket knife in 2020 while arguing over this exact topic. According to a police report, Garcia became enraged at his cousin for disagreeing with him about which milk was better. He allegedly punched the victim in the face, prompting his cousin to take a swing and miss, hitting Garcia's shoulder instead of his head. The victim later told police that this was when Garcia pulled a pocket knife with a three-inch blade. Fearing for his safety, he ran out of the house and into the front yard, where Garcia caught up with him and allegedly slashed his left torso, leaving him with a small cut. The victim's uncle stepped in and restrained Garcia, preventing him from slashing his cousin for a second time, and the two parties were separated until law enforcement arrived. While speaking with deputies, the uncle said that he was working on his car when he overheard Garcia and the victim arguing over almond milk. Garcia accused his cousin of charging at him with a stick and told deputies that the victim thinks he's better than the rest of the family. But his claims failed to clear him of suspicion, and he was arrested on suspicion of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. In the meantime, members of the Lee County Sheriff's Office seized the opportunity to make a joke about how Garcia cried over spilled milk in a Facebook post announcing his arrest. Records show that he was convicted of the charge and is serving a four-year felony probation sentence. Assuming he sticks to the rules and doesn't get into any more trouble, he'll be released from supervision in July of 2025. 3. Idao Noi Quesada when a 23-year-old Florida man was denied a cigarette sale at a Walgreens store in Clearwater after showing his ID, he became so angry that he lost his temper and ended his night in the back of a police car. According to a criminal complaint, Idao Noi Quesada entered the store shortly after 1am and tried to buy a pack of smokes. The report notes that the sale was denied due to store policy, but didn't go into detail about the exact reasons for the denial. There's no shortage of 24-hour stores in Clearwater, but instead of going somewhere else to buy the cigarettes, Idel allegedly pelted the manager, Jessica Larat, with Snickers bars. After noticing what was going on, employee Sean Ellis repeatedly told the suspect to leave the store, at which point Adele's Snickers hurling activities resumed. One of the candy bars hit Ellis in the chest, but neither of the employees was hurt by the flying chocolate. Idel told responding officers that he became angry with the employee for siding with the manager's decision not to sell him cigarettes. He was also offended because Larat had allegedly referred to him as a Spanish guy, but claimed that he didn't mean to throw any snicker bars at Ellis. After viewing the surveillance footage, the arresting officer concluded that Idel's actions appeared to be very intentional. The arrest report also noted that the suspect appeared to be highly intoxicated. Idel was charged with two misdemeanor counts of simple battery and was released from custody on a $1,000 bond. 2. Tyler Warden While responding to a residence in Vero Beach, Florida on a Sunday afternoon in May 2021, police arrived at the scene to find tomato sauce all over the ground and on the face of the 20-year-old woman who placed the 911 call. Identified in a police report as Kristen Warden, she told the officers that her father, 
41-year-old Tyler Warden had stopped by with some pizza for her. But when she told her dad that she wasn't feeling well and asked him to leave, he allegedly became argumentative. The young woman accused Warden of throwing a slice of pizza at her face while she was trying to close the front door. Warden reportedly admitted to throwing the pizza slice, but he claimed that he thought his daughter's front door was closed at the time. He further explained that he'd hoped to eat the pizza with his daughter, and that he got upset when she didn't invite him inside. The officer who spoke with him noted in an arrest report that his breath smelled strongly of booze. While observing the scene, a responding deputy noticed that there was no tomato sauce or toppings on the front door, but that it was all over the floor both inside and outside the door. After concluding that the door was open and that it was highly unlikely that Warden didn't notice this, the deputy arrested him on suspicion of misdemeanor battery. Warden bonded out for $500 and was ordered to have no contact with his daughter. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. Miles Taz Jenkins 35-year-old Miles Taz Jenkins was working as a 7-Eleven clerk in St. Petersburg, Florida in July of 2023 when, allegedly, he hurled a beverage at a customer inside the store. According to an arrest affidavit, Jenkins became frustrated with the victim, Tina Warren, over a payment issue and threw a big gulp cup filled with lemonade at her, striking her in the head. The complaint states that three other customers witnessed the incident and that Jenkins made spontaneous statements admitting to throwing the drink at Warren. Jenkins had previously served a several-year prison sentence for a battery charge and is a registered predator in the state of Florida. Records show that he was released in 2018 and was arrested in 2020 for violating probation. He returned to prison for several months and was freed in July of 2021, only to end up back in custody less than a month later for several weeks. Following his release in July of 2021, Jenkins was listed as a transient living in St. Augustine. At the time of the drink-throwing incident, he was reportedly living at a hotel in Clearwater, which is listed in property records as a rehab or halfway house. Due to his prior conviction, authorities charged him with felony-level battery, which would have otherwise been considered a lower-level offense. 15. Quentel Moultrie and Taylor Mangeres A home break-in along Florida's Palm Coast ended in deadly gunfire in early 2022, when a pair of alleged thieves attempted to burglarize a Flagler County home. According to authorities, 23-year-old Quentel Moultrie his girlfriend, 19-year-old Taylor Mangeres, and a man named Zare Roberts went to the residence of Daniel Marashi for what they believed was supposed to be a drug deal. Something went wrong during the transaction and it led to a shootout between the parties. Marashi shot and killed Zare Roberts, but was not charged in connection with the incident. And although they didn't fire the fatal shot, Quentel Moultrie and Taylor Mangeres were charged with armed burglary second-degree murder, and other crimes. Under Florida law, if someone dies during the commission of a felony, the individuals who committed the crime that was going on at the time can be held criminally liable for the victim's death. Taylor Mangeres took a plea deal and admitted to second-degree murder and principal to armed robbery in exchange for a 10 to 20-year prison sentence. She's scheduled to be sentenced in September 2023 and is being held on $400,000 bail in the meantime. Her decision to turn state's witness could have serious implications for Gwendol Moultrie, who's chosen to leave his fate in the hands of a jury. He's being held on a $400,000 bail while he awaits trial. If convicted of the murder charge, he could face life in prison. And although Danielle Murashi was not charged in connection with Robert's death, he faces a multitude of other charges in unrelated cases. It's unclear whether Mangeres' decision to testify as a witness in exchange for a plea deal will affect Murashi's usefulness to the state in a way that will affect prosecutors' decision over whether or not to grant leniency in his other cases. 14. Shelby Taylor Wise While working at a bank in Houston, Texas back in 2018, 25-year-old Shelby Taylor Wise watched as a customer withdrew $75,000 in cash for her business. 
Surveillance footage showed Wise eyeing the woman while sending a text message on her phone. Later that day, the customer was violently attacked by two men who were after her bag full of money. Prosecutors would later accuse Wise of sending a go signal to the other two suspects, who were identified by law enforcement as her boyfriend, Travon Johnson, and another man named Davis Dowell Mitchell. Video released by police showed two men dragging the victim along the ground and punching and kicking her as she clung desperately to her purse. The pair eventually managed to steal the money from the woman after running her over with a car. She survived but was hospitalized with critical injuries and out $75,000. Her husband was also hurt in the struggle and was treated at the scene for his injuries. Mitchell was arrested at the scene while Johnson turned himself in later on. Police eventually arrested four suspects including Wise. Authorities said that Wise had verified connections with at least one of the other suspects at the time they announced her arrest. She was booked into the Harris County Jail on a second-degree felony robbery charge with bond set at $75,000. As new details of the incident were released, it was revealed that Wise allegedly rented the vehicle that was used as a getaway car in the robbery. She reportedly claimed that she rented the car for the purpose of driving to her father's funeral in Arizona, but that it was stolen. Court records claim that Johnson met with Mitchell prior to the robbery and told him it was a guaranteed $60,000 payout, indicating that Wise was, in fact, involved with the theft. According to records, Wise pleaded guilty and was sentenced to three years in prison. 13. Rachel Juarez and Ronjai Cook What was meant to be a romantic rendezvous for one Texas man turned deadly when he unexpectedly met with foul play during the early morning hours in early 2023. Using a dating app, the 23-year-old connected with the woman later identified as 22-year-old Rachel Juarez. The two made plans to meet at Rachel's apartment complex in Houston at 1 o'clock a.m. 1 February morning. When the man arrived, the young woman escorted him from the parking lot into her apartment. Once inside, he encountered Rachel's boyfriend, 23-year-old Ron Jai Cook, who allegedly demanded his money and belongings at gunpoint. According to investigators, the victim ran to his vehicle, grabbed a rifle, and fatally shot Cook. In the meantime, Rachel dialed 911 and told operators that an armed man was at her home. Cook was found dead in the parking lot of the apartment complex. Police also recovered a fake gun wrapped in duct tape at the scene which they believe Cook used in the attempted robbery. Rachel Juarez was charged with aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon. She remains behind bars at the Harris County Jail on $50,000 bond while awaiting the next steps in her case. When the story first broke, the media reported that the robbery victim had been taken in for questioning and that once the investigation was over, the case would go to a grand jury to decide whether or not to press homicide charges against the man. There have been no updates since, indicating that the investigation is still ongoing or that the jury decided not to move forward with the charges. In some states, being able to run away from a thief means that you cannot legally shoot them in self-defense. Other states have more generous laws when it comes to a person's right to pull the trigger against someone who victimizes them in a violent crime. 12. Gavin Williams and Lars Albertson Hospital staff members in St. George, Utah were more than a little suspicious in January 2023 when a man showed up at an emergency room with six gunshot wounds to his arm and 11 bullet holes on the outside of his vehicle near the driver's seat. Meanwhile, police responded to a report of shots fired on a nearby highway where they found multiple shell casings and jars filled with marijuana. During a months-long investigation that followed, law enforcement identified eight suspects who were allegedly involved in the botched robbery. Detectives ultimately identified 19-year-olds Gavin David Williams and Lars Randall Albertson as the accused shooters. Authorities finally arrested the pair in May 2023, four months after the incident occurred. According to records, the other suspects pointed toward Gavin Williams as the mastermind of a plot to rob the victim's marijuana. He allegedly provided the guns that were used in the shooting, while Albertson provided a photo of the money to the victim as supposed proof 
that the suspects were good for the purchase, even though they never planned on paying for the weed in the first place. According to the accomplices who chose to speak to law enforcement, Williams and Albertson fired shots at the victim while he was in his vehicle, attempting to flee the scene. The suspects also accused Williams of threatening to kill his co-conspirators if they told anyone about the botched robbery, and of deceiving his girlfriend regarding his whereabouts during the incident after finding out that she spoke with detectives. Williams and Albertson each face one count of attempted murder, one count of felony aggravated robbery, felony criminal mischief resulting in the loss of more than $5,000, felony criminal conspiracy, and a felony gun-related charge. 11. Norman Newsom and Alton Brown As they entered their home in Oswego County, New York late one night in late 2021, 41-year-old Russell Barden, 41-year-old Aaron Smith, and Smith's girlfriend were ambushed by two men in bandanas who forced them into the house. Just moments later, Smith collapsed from a single gunshot. His girlfriend heard one or two more gunshots as she ran toward the garage in an attempt to flee the scene. She eventually re-entered the home and found both Smith and Barden suffering from gunshot wounds. Barden survived, but Smith died from his injuries. Investigators ultimately traced the deadly robbery to three suspects. Barden's ex-girlfriend, Brittany Yerdon, pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and second-degree attempted murder in exchange for a prison sentence of 23 years to life. The other two suspects, Alton D. Brown and Norman A. Newsom, rejected plea offers, which would have come with sentences of 25 years to life, and instead chose to go to trial. They were both convicted of all charges they faced, which included three counts each of second-degree murder, two counts of second-degree attempted murder, three counts of first-degree assault, and one count each of first-degree burglary, first-degree attempted robbery, second-degree attempted robbery, and a weapon-related charge. At Brown's sentencing, Chief District Attorney Mark Moody described the defendant as incapable of living within the bounds of the law. He said he couldn't think of anyone more deserving of the maximum sentence and implored the judge to more or less throw the book at Brown. Brown's defense attorney, Sean Chase, claimed that his client had no idea a shooting was going to occur. He acknowledged that Brown was a career drug dealer, but insisted that he felt deeply remorseful over the deadly outcome of the situation. Chase further described Brown as having a limited ability to support his family and essentially committing the crime out of desperation. He also mentioned Brown's lack of prior violent convictions as a potential mitigating factor to be considered in the defendant's sentence. The prosecution described Newsom's role in the shooting as horrendous, and while Moody acknowledged that the defendant lacked a lengthy criminal history, he pointed out that Newsom did have a prior first-degree robbery conviction and urged the judge to sentence the defendant appropriately for being an active participant in the more recent incident. During the hearing, Newsom spoke briefly, apologizing for what happened, but denying accountability for pulling the trigger. But the defense pleas failed to garner much leniency. Alton Brown was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison, while Newsom received a sentence of 40 years to life. If either of the men ever see freedom again, they'll spend the remainder of their lives on supervised release. Neither defendant admitted to being the shooter. In fact, both denied it, which at the very least shows a lack of responsibility and remorse on at least one of their behalves. While this may sound like your run-of-the-mill robbery gone wrong, Cases like this are rare in the part of New York State where the botched home invasion occurred. It was the first homicide case to go to trial in Oswego County since 2015. To this day, nobody knows for sure who pulled the trigger. 10. Zaya Brooks A young man from Detroit named Edmund Lamont Butler was found unresponsive in his car one afternoon in July 2022 with a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. By the time officers discovered the young man while responding to a call about shots fired, it was unfortunately too late to save him. He'd been gunned down in broad daylight. Nearly two months passed without any arrests as law enforcement investigated the perplexing case. Finally, in September 2022, authorities announced that they'd finally charged someone in connection with the case, the victim's lifelong best friend, 
Zaya Brooks. According to investigators, Brooks confessed to fatally shooting Butler during a robbery gone wrong. He allegedly admitted that he planned to meet with the victim to buy $200 worth of marijuana, but that it was a setup. Brooks allegedly got into the backseat of the car behind Butler, who was sitting in the driver's seat, and shot him before fleeing the scene. Although the situation clearly appears to be a bungled robbery, the fact that Butler and Brooks were best friends calls into question the alleged shooter's motive, which remains unclear. Brooks faces charges of felony murder, carrying a concealed weapon, and two felony gun counts. He's being charged as an adult and will face court proceedings and potential consequences accordingly. In a statement, prosecutor Kim Worthy said that the decision to hold the defendant accountable as an adult came after carefully weighing his alleged degree of decisiveness and weighing of his options. In other words, the prosecution believes that Brooks thought long and hard enough about his actions ahead of time to understand the gravity of the crime and to demonstrate a significant level of intent. And in Worthy's words, the situation is truly tragic any way you look at it. 9. Bonnie Betsy Gooch A bank teller in Pleasant Hill, Missouri, roughly 35 miles southeast of Kansas City, came face to face with an unlikely suspect in April 2023 when an elderly woman approached with a note demanding money. The handwritten message was bizarrely apologetic in nature, containing an instruction for 13,000 small bills, followed by, thanks, I didn't mean to scare you. Based on surveillance footage and witness statements, law enforcement described the suspect as wearing a surgical mask, sunglasses, and plastic gloves. She approached the counter in broad daylight around 3.20 p.m. and could be seen banging on the counter and urging the teller to hurry in a security video of the attempted heist. The suspect, identified by authorities as 78-year-old Bonnie Gooch, didn't get very far before she was nabbed by police. She was pulled over just two miles away from the bank. According to police, the floor of her vehicle was covered in cash. Miss Gooch also allegedly reeked of booze, but she wasn't charged with any alcohol-related crimes. Speaking with the Kansas City Star, Pleasant Hill Police Chief Tommy Wright said that the arresting officers were confused when a little old lady stepped out of the suspected getaway vehicle. In fact, he said, they weren't even sure if they had the right person at first. In three decades of working in law enforcement, Wright had never encountered a robbery suspect who was pushing 80 years old. But Robbie Banks is apparently nothing new for Gooch, who has two prior convictions on her record for the crime, one from a 1977 heist in California and another from a 2020 robbery outside Kansas City, which she was on probation for until November 2021. According to the most recent available updates, the case is ongoing. 8. Fatal Florida Drug Robbery On April 29, 2023, 20-year-old Brent Alley and a friend traveled across Florida in a rented Porsche, driving from Jacksonville to Pinellas County to buy $40,000 worth of marijuana from 26-year-old Joshua Ashley. But something went terribly wrong. Deputies responded to a report of shots fired and found Ali unresponsive and suffering from a single gunshot wound to the abdomen. He was pronounced dead at a nearby hospital and a lengthy and complex investigation followed. The findings revealed that Joshua Ashley was the victim's marijuana supplier, but this time was different. Instead of business as usual, Ashley allegedly conspired with three other suspects to rob Ali instead of providing him with the product he was coming for. According to detectives, Ashley and one of his accomplices, 32-year-old Terrell Jackson, stopped at Ashley's house to retrieve a handgun before the planned robbery. From there, they proceeded to 32-year-old Scott Laracuente's apartment at a commercial business center. Based on interviews with the suspects, prosecutors believe that a fourth suspect, 43-year-old Tyre Turner, waited in a stairwell with a gun. After arriving at the address around 6 o'clock in the evening, Ali and his friend, 22-year-old Kyle Foster, entered the building with a bag full of cash. Ali encountered Lara Cuente, Ashley, and Jackson, and something about the way they were acting concerned him, so he exited the building and returned to his car. 
he put the money in the vehicle and re-entered the building with his own gun. For the next half hour or so, the men apparently just hung out and talked. Around 6.30 p.m., Jackson and Ashley reportedly left the apartment to pick up food. Shortly after Ashley handed Ali this food, Turner emerged from beneath the stairwell where he was hiding and shot Ali. According to a sheriff's report, Ali's milkshake spilled everywhere and he stumbled outside while crying in pain. He collapsed and died in the parking lot, while the suspects fled the scene and went on the run. Lara Cuente went to Las Vegas, while Ashley and Jackson were found in Los Angeles. Police eventually picked up the trio at Mandalay Bay Casino in Las Vegas. Turner was apprehended in Virginia by U.S. Marshals. All four men are being held without bond at the Pinellas County Jail, with each facing a first-degree murder charge. Pinellas County Sheriff Bob Gualtieri described video footage of Ali's death as sad, but also refused to consider the young man an innocent victim. In Gualtieri's words, when you play with fire, you're gonna get burned. 7. The Shooting of Troy Patterson 27-year-old NYPD officer Troy Patterson was off-duty when he was confronted by a trio of thieves while washing his car in Brooklyn's Bedford Stuyveson neighborhood one day in January 1990. Three young men ambushed the cop and demanded money before one of the suspects pulled a gun and shot Patterson in the head, who survived but spent the next 33 years in a catatonic state. This would have been a horrific act for any amount of money, but it's utterly shocking that the thieves pulled the trigger in a bid to obtain $20 to join a basketball league with. The shooting happened at a particularly violent time in New York City's history. It happened just days into the year, adding on to the 2,445 murders that took place the previous year. But the particularly brutal nature of the crime and the fact that a member of law enforcement was mercilessly gunned down in cold blood left the city in an especially shocked state. In 2016, Patterson was promoted to the rank of detective. It was a symbolic but highly meaningful promotion for the chronically injured cop, who spent decades unable to care for himself or communicate verbally. His mother and other relatives cared for him until they were no longer able to at which point he was moved to an assisted care facility, where his family visited him regularly. Although he couldn't talk, his loved ones said that they believed he could feel their presence. Patterson passed away at a rehabilitation center in New Jersey in 2023, after living in a vegetative-like state for 33 years. He was 60 years old. The alleged shooter, Tracy Clark, was just a teen when he made the fateful decision to pull the trigger. He was convicted of assault, attempted robbery, and a weapon-related charge. But he was acquitted of attempted murder and given a shockingly light sentence due to his young age. Had Clark been over 18 at the time of the crime, he could have faced life behind bars. Instead, he spent just a few months incarcerated before regaining his freedom. His two accomplices were also convicted of their roles in botched robbery and have served their time. Following Patterson's death, Clark, who's now 49 years old, publicly apologized for his actions while also insisting that he had paid his debt to society for the crime. His words fell on deaf ears, however, with many feeling as if Clark and his co-conspirators never truly faced justice. Clark has served time for other crimes. In 2003, he was convicted of possessing narcotics with intent to distribute in Orangeburg County, South Carolina. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and was released in 2017. In May 2023, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office announced that they were considering the possibility of pressing additional charges against the three men now that Patterson had passed away. A spokesperson said that the process of reviewing the case may take several weeks, and the DA's decision on whether to levy additional charges against the trio has yet to be revealed. Speaking with the New York Post, Clark said that he doesn't have much to say about the situation. He described the ordeal as a 30-year nightmare and declined to comment on the possibility that he could face new charges. Clark did offer his condolences to Patterson's family and said that he will surrender willingly to law enforcement if he's held criminally liable for the fallen officer's death. The case is ongoing. 
1906 near fatal Stamford shooting. A Stamford, Connecticut man was rushed to the hospital with life-threatening injuries in February 2023 after being shot in the abdomen during a botched robbery. It happened in the driveway of a local home during the pre-dawn hours. The victim was rushed to the emergency room and spent several days in intensive care with a perforated liver and internal bleeding. His injuries were serious and he was lucky to survive. A lengthy investigation ensued. Nearly two months later, police finally arrested the first of three suspects in the case, 37-year-old Jose Enrique Montanez of Bridgeport. In the process of identifying Montanez as a suspect, investigators also traced the vehicle they believe was used in the crime. They found Montanez near the crime scene and took him into custody with help from specially trained organized crime and narcotics officers. Montanez faces charges of assault, robbery, conspiracy to commit robbery, and criminal possession of a firearm. He already has numerous drug-related felony convictions under his belt and is being held on $900,000 bail while his current case works its way through the court system. Just days after arresting Montanez, authorities nabbed a second suspect, David Lewis of New Milford. He faces the same charges as his alleged co-conspirator and is being held on a $150,000 bond. The victim is fortunate to be alive, and the suspects are also lucky the victim survived. They could go to prison for a long time if convicted of the charges they face, but they would potentially be facing a much longer sentence if they were facing homicide charges. A third suspect remains at large. 5. Casino Hold-Up Crew 32-year-old Anthony Rivas was working as a security guard at a hooker lounge in California's Hollywood Hills during the early morning hours of May 31, 2023 when a pair of masked robbers stormed the premises with assault rifles. Rivas drew his handgun in an attempt to defend himself and was mercilessly gunned down in a hailstorm of gunfire. He died at the scene, leaving behind a young son. According to LAPD, the business was being used as an underground casino. After hearing the gunshots, around 30 customers and workers fled the scene in a panic. The robbers left without collecting any of the money they came for, and the case was handed over to the LAPD's gang unit. A major break came when one of the officers assigned to the case recognized the thief's getaway car in security footage from the botched holdup. By tracing what they knew about the car, investigators identified 29-year-old Matthew S. Riley as their first suspect. Further investigation led them to a second suspect, 26-year-old Rudy J. Madrid. Both Riley and Madrid matched the eyewitness descriptions of the gunmen as tall and skinny. The men each face a murder charge in connection with the crime. Authorities also charged two additional suspects, 23-year-old Stephen H. Dunkel and 52-year-old Michael J. Blankenship with conspiracy to commit robbery. According to investigators, the four men were operating as an organized casino hold'em crew that targeted illegal high-stakes games. They base this theory on the fact that Stephen Dunkel, who has no prior criminal history, previously worked in various gambling parlors as a car dealer. He's accused of being the robbery crew's inside man who provided leads on which games to rob. Detectives believe Michael Blankenship acted as a decoy by entering the parlor ahead of time to ensure that the door was not locked and to distract security guards. Rivas confronted Blankenship, at which point police believe Riley and Madrid barged in with their guns. The building where the deadly robbery occurred is owned by a surgeon who insisted to law enforcement that he believed the storefront was being legitimately rented out as a hooker lounge. But the person who was running the illegal gambling lounge reportedly admitted to investigators that he paid $10,000 per month to the surgeon to host games twice a week. Inside the parlor, police found two large poker tables, a fully stuffed kitchen and bar, and multiple prostitutes. The hosts also offered valet parking in a nearby gated lot. But the underground activity came to an abrupt halt when it ended in murder, and the outcome of the situation for the suspects is yet to be seen. 4. Randy Jones While off-duty one evening in early 2023, a 26-year-old NYPD officer named Adid Fayaz 
went with his brother-in-law to Brooklyn's East New York neighborhood to buy a Honda Pilot that was advertised for sale for $24,000 on Facebook. When Fires and his brother-in-law arrived at the designated address, the man they met with led them into an alleyway and jokingly asked if they were armed. He then put Fires in a headlock and demanded the money for the car. According to an NYPD spokesperson, Fires said he didn't have the money, at which point the thief pointed a gun at the officer's brother-in-law. It would later be revealed that Fires and his brother-in-law had left the cash for the Honda in their vehicle, which is why the thief never got his hands on it. Fires fought back against his attacker and managed to break free from the headlock, but was shot in the head. The perpetrator then fled the scene, firing several more shots as he ran away and then sped off in a BMW. In the meantime, Fires' brother-in-law grabbed the off-duty cop's gun from his holster and shot back at the suspect. One of the vehicles hit the getaway vehicle, but neither the suspect nor the brother-in-law were injured. EMTs rushed Fires to the hospital, where he clung to life for three days before succumbing to his injuries. Two days after the crime, while Fires was still fighting for his life, authorities tracked down and arrested the suspected shooter, 38-year-old Randy Popper Jones, at a motel in Long Island. He was found hiding out in a room with a woman and five kids and had allegedly tried to conceal the bullet hole on his vehicle with tape. Jones was charged with murder and attempted robbery and is currently being held without bail at Rikers Island while the case proceeds in court. More than 100 police officers attended his arraignment in honor of Fias. During his most recent court appearance in May 2023, which lasted for just three minutes, Jones was formally indicted on the charges. So many comps attended in Fias' honor that the judge moved the proceeding to a bigger courtroom in order to accommodate everyone there. The seats were completely filled, and members of law enforcement lined the walls. In addition to being accused of killing a cop, Jones faces charges for a similar incident that happened just weeks earlier and ended without any bloodshed. According to police documents, Jones met with another man in mid-January regarding a Honda Odyssey he advertised on Facebook Marketplace. When the buyer arrived, he pulled a gun and robbed the victim of $18,000 cash. If convicted, Jones could face life in prison without parole, which is exactly what he deserves, according to Police Benevolent Association President Patrick Lynch, who described Jones as a ruthless and dangerous killer who preys not only on innocent New Yorkers, but on trained and armed police officers. 3. Oscar Gonzalez Alerenja One afternoon in April 2023, a male suspect entered a Wells Fargo bank in Arlington, Virginia, right across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C., grabbed an employee and claimed to have a gun. He took five people hostage and demanded money as he walked behind the counter. Police cordoned off a several-block area and surrounded the bank as the suspect barricaded himself and his captives inside the bank. Specially trained emergency response team members got as close to the building as they could and issued instructions to the suspect. Luckily, he complied. Just an hour after the robbery began, the hostages exited the bank. Paramedics examined everyone on the scene and gave them all a clean bill of health. The hostages were followed by the suspect, identified by law enforcement as 30-year-old Oscar Gonzalez Araranja of Raleigh, North Carolina, who was taken into custody without incident. After exiting the building empty-handed, he was charged with robbery and abduction. And as it turned out, he also may have been bluffing when he made it seem like he had a weapon, because no weapons were found at the scene. According to the most recent media updates on the case, the investigation is ongoing. 2. NYC Nightclub Robbery Spree Over a 15-month period starting in March of 2021, at least one organized group of criminals drugged and robbed 16 or more patrons at gay nightclubs in New York City's Hell's Kitchen district. At least seven people were killed. Two victims, 25-year-old Julio Ramirez and 33-year-old John Umberger, died from overdoses of fentanyl along with other drugs that were found in their systems. The perpetrators made off with their victims' cell phones, wallets, and other belongings, and they used the victims' debit and credit cards to take money from their accounts. 
Authorities initially believed the deaths were accidental until they discovered the stolen funds. It was at that point that they began investigating the cases as homicides. According to Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, members of the theft ring approached customers as they were leaving bars, engaged them in conversation, offered them drugs, and proceeded to rob the victims. Cell phone footage from inside an apartment allegedly showed two suspects with one of the victims who was unconscious on a bed, lying in the same position he was found dead in. Months dragged on without any arrests. Finally, in March 2023, a grand jury indicted six defendants in Ramirez and Umberger's deaths. All six suspects face robbery, identity theft, grand larceny, and conspiracy charges. The alleged ringleader, 35-year-old J. Quan Hamilton, and his accused co-conspirator, 34-year-old Robert DeMaio, were each charged with two counts of murder, while 29-year-old Jacob Barroso was hit with one murder count. Given the fact that the victims were targeted at gay nightclubs, it was only natural to wonder if the crimes were at least partially motivated by hate. But that wasn't the case, according to New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who said that the thieves were driven purely by greed and a reckless disregard for the safety and lives of their victims. It's unclear whether the six men who are currently facing charges are connected with any of the other nightclub overdose deaths. Investigators have also not yet speculated on whether they believe the deaths were intentional, although a second-degree murder charge is typically issued in cases of suspected intentional homicide in New York State. According to authorities, the investigation is ongoing. 1. Ronald Jackson Jr. 36-year-old James Williams was working the overnight shift at a Chevron gas station in Antioch, California in 2022 when he came face to face with two armed thieves. Police found him on the floor with a gunshot wound during the early morning hours while responding to a report of a shooting at the store. According to law enforcement, Williams told his co-worker, Annette Matamoros, that someone was trying to rob the store and to stay put. Annette later told ABC7 that she overheard gunshots while hiding in the bathroom. She ran out of the restroom and saw Williams falling to the ground. The traumatized worker told the news station that she knew it was bad when she saw her colleague on the floor in a pool of blood and with blood pouring out of his mouth. Authorities revealed that Williams chased after and shot at both suspects, striking 20-year-old Ronald Jackson Jr. in the leg. Jackson allegedly shot back, striking Williams in the chest and leg. The clerk died from his injuries. Investigators revealed that Jackson and another suspect made off with cigars and an undisclosed amount of cash. Annette Matamoros, who was working with Williams at the time of the disturbing encounter, told ABC7 that less than $150 is kept in the cash register at all times, so it's unlikely that the thieves got much money, and sadly, a man needlessly died in the process. Despite the fatal nature of the robbery, the district attorney's office declined to press murder charges against Jackson. He faces one count each of robbery, possession of stolen property, and a firearm enhancement, which means that the charge was upgraded to a more serious level because a gun was involved. Sadly, the other suspects in the case remain at large. Who would you rather have? A friend who finds a reason to complain about almost everything, even when they get their way? or a friend who never speaks up about the things that bother them and goes to irrational lengths to avoid offending anyone? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye!